Okay, hello, welcome to a macro video, an update video, looking at the key macroeconomic objectives for the government and focusing in this video on some of the latest data for the UK. So we'll take a look at the main macro objectives. We'll have a look at uh, some of the key information, the key data for the UK at a critical time as we come to the end of 2020. And we'll also take a moment to recap some of the critical definitions that always go down well in exam answers. So what are the main macroeconomic objectives for a government? Well, of course, there are plenty and it's important to know a range of them. Here, on, here are uh, eight of them <laughs> enlisted on this, uh, this slide. First one would be sustainable and balanced growth of real GDP. So governments want their, their countries, their economy to grow, but in a sustainable and balanced fashion. Oftentimes, they also want to keep control of cost and price inflation, keep uh, prices relatively stable, perhaps with the aid and the help of an official inflation target set to the central bank. Governments want the labour market to be performing well with high employment, low unemployment and also a reduced level of inactivity in the labour market, increasing the participation rate of people of working age. Those three, uh, growth, prices and jobs, I've put in red there deliberately, I cluster those together and call those key domestic objectives. Growth, prices, jobs. Another set of objectives is to improve the competitiveness of a country. And one of those measures could be to improve relative productivity, output per worker. And linked to that, uh, to maintain a sustainable overseas trade balance in goods and services and a sustainable balance on the current account of the balance of payments. The green ones, though, I've lumped together a little bit and call those external objectives, in particular trade and competitiveness. And then we start to widen things out. Of course, you can have a much broader conception of what the objectives of governments might be. For many people, well, for millions of people, in fact, it's access to, affordability of, and the quality of public services, key public services like education, housing, health. So that's quite important for many, many people. Access to welfare, access to uh, basic essential public services. And linked to that, of course, is the sustainability of government finances, the extent to which governments have to borrow and ultimately tax to pay for these services and the extent to which they fall into debt. One of the key objectives now increasingly becoming apparent, particularly with the impact of COVID, the pandemic, both in the UK and other countries, is the issue of equitable distribution of income and wealth. So some governments now prioritise attempts to improve uh, and reduce inequality of income and wealth through tax and welfare and other policies. That can be a macro objective. And increasingly, people are looking beyond GDP, beyond GDP per capita, beyond measures of material well-being and saying that governments should perhaps prioritise well-being in a much broader sense rather than just the narrow conception of national output. So those are some of the key macro objectives. The key exam point is that those aims, those objectives will vary from country to country, depending on where they are in their development and growth journey. So certain governments will have a different weighting when setting policy. They'll give, for example, more priority to jobs, perhaps, than inflation control. They'll give more priority to reducing inequality than, who knows, improving the trade balance. So those objectives don't necessarily have a similar weighting. We're going to race through some of the key objectives of policy and just make sure you're aware of what's going on here. First of all, uh, the idea of sustainable growth. Growth to an economist is the long term expansion of productive potential and sustainable growth meets the needs of current generations without damaging, threatening the natural capital and natural resources available for future generations of citizens. So increasingly sustainable growth is important. Of course, in the short term, uh, economic news is dominated by what's happening to the economic cycle. And this chart shows the extent of the shock that has hit the UK in 2020 with the coronavirus pandemic. A huge fall in GDP, a little bit of a rebound since, then another uh, dip. And, and the forecast is that the, the level of GDP will be well below the end of 2021, well below where it was just two years before. This is a chart showing the annual level of GDP in billions of pounds adjusted for inflation. And again, you can see the impact 
of the coronavirus pandemic in 2020. Some sectors have been hit particularly hard. According to the latest data from the Office of Budget Responsibility, from January to April in 2020, the whole economy shrank by a quarter. And across the year, January to November 2020, the fall in output has been 15%. But many sectors have suffered much more than that, in particular retail, accommodation and food services, transportation and others. One way of thinking about GDP, of course, is to think about aggregate demand. C plus I plus G plus X minus M. And here's the data for aggregate demand in the UK. You can see the extent of the fall in consumer spending, investment spending, the big drop off in trade. Government spending, of course, is up. There has been quite a significant fiscal stimulus in response to, to the crisis. C plus I plus G plus X minus M gives us aggregate demand. According to this data, from the last institute august 2020 gdp down 10% in real terms on the year another key objective of governments is price stability or low inflation and price stability exists when the average consumer prices for goods and services measured by the consumer price index well they're constant over time or when they're rising at a low and fairly predictable rate and of course, the UK has an inflation target for the consumer price index of 2% inflation. Here's the data for the UK. There's the inflation target in the brown dotted line. You can see inflation has been above or below, but not massively out of line over the last 10 years. Indeed, since 2017, the rate of inflation on average has been falling. And of course, has been below target for some little time now, as you'd expect, as the economy has dived into recession. The point I want to make here is that inflation, OK, we have an inflation target, but I don't think anybody is seriously suggesting that, infl that inflation is the dominant macro objective in 2020. I mean, it clearly isn't. Uh, jobs, sustaining growth, rebuilding the economy, getting through the public health crisis, those are the key objectives. Jobs, of course, unemployment. The unemployment rate measures those people who have been actively seeking work within the last month and are available to start work within the next fortnight and the unemployment rate often used as a measure is the percentage of the economically active population who are out of work. Now the economically active population are those people in work plus those people actively seeking and available to work. And here's the data for the UK including a forecast for 2021. You can see that uh, in recent times, the rate of unemployment has been falling and it was falling below 4% of the labour force. This was uh, uh, perceived as being a significant benchmark. If you look at the orange line there, that's the unemployment rate as a percentage on the left hand scale. It dipped below 4% in 2019 and people were saying, well, could we reach full employment? Somewhere close to 3% unemployment. But then, of course, the pandemic hits, unemployment starts to rise. The biggest rise is yet to come. According to this forecast, there's going to be a significant jump in unemployment in the first and second quarters of next year, taking unemployment back up to 7 perhaps even 8%. And that's a rise in unemployment of, of around a million people. A significant change. Productivity is another objective of macro policy. It's a measure of supply-side efficiency. You can measure productivity in various ways, including output per person employed, output per hour worked, output per job. There's all kinds of ways of measuring productivity. One of the interesting facets and issues at the moment is the extent to which productivity in the UK relative to other countries is low. And this chart is quite interesting, taken from 2016. It's the latest data I could find. And uh, if UK productivity is given an index number of 100, it suggests that countries such as Germany and France and the United States are well ahead of the UK in terms of GDP per hour worked. We are better than Japan, slightly better than Canada, but 11% behind Italy. So closing that productivity gap is important. And one reason is the trade balance. The trade balance is another macro objective, and it measures the difference between the value of exports of goods and services and the value of imports. Now, oftentimes in an exam, you hear students say the trade balance is the difference between exports and imports. No, it isn't. It's the difference between the value of the items we export minus the value of the goods and services we import. And you can run a trade surplus or a trade deficit depending on those two figures. 
Well, here's the data for the UK all the way through to 2019. Follow the blue line first. We run a significant trade deficit in goods of around 6% of our GDP. But we're pretty good at services. Our trade surplus in services has been above 4% of GDP over in each of the last 10 years. But to put the two together, the blue dominates the orange. So Britain has been running a trade deficit. The value of exports less than the value of imports of around 1, 1.5% of GDP uh, in, in each of the last 10 years or so. We run a structural trade deficit. Many people confuse the trade deficit with the budget deficit. I'm sure you won't do that. The budget balance is the gap between what the government spends and what it takes in in tax. And the budget is in surplus when tax revenues are greater than spending in a given year, but a deficit if the government is spending more than it's taking in in tax. And that deficit is financed by borrowing money, issue of debt. Now this chart goes all the way back to 1900, the turn of the 20th century. And it shows government borrowing, how much they have to borrow as a, a measure as a percentage of the size of the economy, GDP. And you can see that um, in war years, government borrowing surges and dramatically climbs. It's very rare, by the way, that governments run a surplus. Any figure in the negative there would be a budget surplus. Very, very, very rare that happens. But the point of context here is that the amount of government borrowing has been huge in the past. I just take the figure since 20, 1950. You can see, though, that 2020 will show a record, certainly since the Second World War, a record, record level of government borrowing of about 19% of GDP. This is, a, this is budget deficit on a scale that nobody alive realistically has, has seen uh, before. And that's, of course, going to lead to an increase in debt. The government, the national debt is the government's outstanding debt. I think it's gone now above 100% of GDP. National debt is expressed as a share of GDP. So that's the amount of debt yet to be repaid. Just finishing off, uh, one or two other objectives. So we've covered lots of objectives in this video. Another one is, of course, the distribution of income and wealth. And one measure of that, the depth or the scale of that inequality is something called the Lorentz curve. Now you create a Lorentz curve by getting the data on income for different households and then ranking households from the poorest, the first, second deciles of the population, all the way through to the richest, better off households. And you graph the cumulative share of their income and the cumulative share of households. That's what creates a Lorentz curve. Here it is in orange for 2016-2017 on the y-axis it's the cumulative share of income so you go all the way up to 100 percent and on the x-axis the household share so on the left hand side the poorest households through to the 100 percent the richest households and you can see that curve is skewed this line here i'll use my cursor this line here straight line if, if you follow just that line that will be a line of perfect equality every 10 percent of households getting 10 percent of income but you can see that these households here don't get a proportional share of income, uh, whereas these households here get a high percentage of income. Now, one way of just showing that slightly differently is this chart. It's exactly the same data, by the way. So the bottom 10% of households get just under 3% of disposable income. This next poorest 10% only get 5% and so on and so forth. Indeed, the first five deciles, the first six deciles, get less than 10%. Of course, if it was all equal, they'd all get 10%. And notice that the top decile, the richest 10%, get 25% of the disposable income. Even after tax, they still take a quarter of all the income in the economy. And hence, you get this income inequality between poor and rich households. One way of measuring this is the Gini coefficient. It's a measure of the degree of income inequality. And zero is when there is complete equality. Everybody has the same income. One represents complete inequality. Let's go back to our Lorentz curve. The Gini coefficient is the area A divided by the area A plus B. So if there was no inequality, uh, you'd have a value of zero. The A would disappear. 
and if there's perfect inequality you have a value of one and the figure for the uk for 2019 shows a gini coefficient of 0.35 before housing costs and 0.39 after housing costs housing costs in particular the cost of renting is a massive cost for many households it takes up a big percentage of their disposable income finally well-being now we've got a separate video on well-being so i won't say too much about it suffice to say that it is now becoming an important objective of macro policy so and it's essentially measured using surveys as well as a range of other data well-being looks beyond what a country produces it looks tries to look beyond gdp gdp per capita all that kind of stuff and tries to encompass and bring into the discussion uh, areas such as health our relationships education and skills what do we do where we live the environment in which we operate our day-to-day -day emotions such as happiness and anxiety well-being is increasingly regarded as an important macroeconomic as well as a social indicator so there we go this has been a video looking at a wide range of macroeconomic economic objectives be aware of what they are have a good feel for the data and uh, you can always go back to these macro objectives if you get a, a nice juicy macro essay question okay thank you very much indeed